I want to encourage you to join us for worship on the last Sunday of June, June 27th. I have the privilege and honor of bringing the message for that Sunday. And afterwards, I'm hoping you will join us right here on the Aiken Street side of First Church, where we're going to share in our celebration with the use of rainbow sherbet. And we hope that you will come and ask us questions about our journeys and those who have joined us on this faith expression during the month of June, June 27th. See you in church. Although this song is celebrated in the life of this and many congregations, the potential for cultural appropriation is high. I almost didn't use it for that very reason. But today, as we celebrate Juneteenth here, please check out the link I've put in the church video description for the rich history of this Zulu chorus and how it came to be used to help and racial discrimination in South Africa. We are walking in the light of God. 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 We are walking. Good morning. This is Pastor Tracy of First United Methodist Church of Pittsburgh, and we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. Here at First United Methodist Church, we strive to be a church where we recognize and believe that God's grace is available to everyone. So we seek to openly welcome and to minister to and with all of God's children, regardless of Christian perspective education, economic condition, race, gender, national origin, physical and mental abilities, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, or marital status. We hope that through the invisible embrace of God that holds us together this morning, that you will find love and compassion in this community and that your time here this morning will be deep and meaningful. Today, we remember parts of our story. There are so many parts of our story. 
We continue to celebrate 10 years of being a reconciling congregation in the United Methodist Church. Today, we we remember and we celebrate and we learn about Juneteenth. And today is a beautiful day in the lives of many families all across this nation as we remember Father's Day. And we remember all those in our lives who have, who have given us these, the tender gift of love and support and wisdom that have shared with us all those in our lives that share those very many godlike qualities that help us be better people, that help us feel more secure in life, and that support us as we learn how to support one another in this sometimes crazy life. So happy Father's Day to all and to everyone. Remember to share that greeting with others that you meet today. But I invite you now just to take that deep breath that prepares your heart and your mind for worship, wherever you may be, I invite you to come and to be in the midst and to dwell in God's grace as we worship this day. Join along in the chat room. Say hi to a friend. Introduce yourself. We're so glad you're here. Amen and amen. Please join us in the call to worship. All you who delight in the sacred strange, come and worship the Creator. Thanks Thanks be be to God, who blesses the peculiar peculiar and rejoices in the uniqueness uniqueness of every every body and being. being. The holy takes on flesh in every gender and sexual orientation, every race and ability, every body size and body type. Each embodied difference is a unique glimpse of holy wonder. Blessed Blessed are those who search for God among among the lives of the oppressed, oppressed, the betrayed, betrayed, the turned turned away, away, and the condemned. condemned. Blessed are those who receive with joy the gifts of God enfleshed among us. The The sacred sacred is with with us. us. Let us worship worship and be be transformed. transformed.
we had a, a couple in the church who uh, came into my office and told me, well, we're in love and we're, we want to affirm our love within the congregation. They said, we, how can we bring this um, in an affirmative way to the congregation, which has already loved us individually, now they can affirm us as a couple. And we came up with a, a plan which was wonderfully creative, and Rini had a role in this, because she was, the, I think, the initiator of, well, why don't you try this? <laughs> Namely, Moravian Love Feast. That would be the format of an event where we would invite families and friends to come. But of course, uh, the couple, Hannah and Lisa, would uh, say they're thankful for each other. And they would be obvious hosts. Yeah, th this was our home. This was the place where we felt spiritually connected. Um, and anywhere else felt like it fell short of what we were trying to do for ourselves and the relationship that we wanted to commit to in front of our family and f church family and God. And this was the place where that should have happened or needed to happen. Right. We carefully planned the, the, the service. It went off exactly as we planned. I was very pleased with the spirit and the details. Um, ironically, in order to fulfill this the restrictions that I knew about in the Methodist Church, I was not allowed to have an exchange of vows or even have a blessing. Can you think? You hear the irony of that? That as I was walking, I was just feeling this sort of sense of relief that, yes, this is where we needed to do it, and oh look, there's that person or that person or that person, and that was, you know, relieving. Um, and I could feel, even though we didn't say any vows or do any of the traditional things, I felt like everyone understood they were witnessing something that we were trying to build. and. It felt really good to have all that love pouring at us. Well, I was surprised when suddenly it bubbled up that we were going to talk about becoming a reconciling church. I um, but was very pleased, and I think it was um, Jeff Miller who put together the education program, Claiming the Promise. And we had a nice group of people in the parlor studying Claiming the Promise to prepare ourselves, even though some people in the church had already done that kind of work, and some people in the church were all ready to do the vote yesterday. We, we did this very important education work in the process of making the decision. And as we came towards the end of it, we knew we needed to uh, put together our, our plan for voting. And I remember it was in staff meeting, we were talking about how we were gonna do this. And Bob said, it has to be a unanimous vote. And I was surprised because you're thinking it's gonna be conflict. So there's gonna be winners and losers in the usual kind of way. And, but, but he was brilliant in that decision because as I thought about it, who would want to come to a church that you know that there are 10 people here who voted against me being able to sit in this pew? So there were some people who were feeling really strongly that we needed to become official members of the Reconciling Ministry Network um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the broader United Methodist Church, a caucus of the United Methodist Church. And we equally had people who were feeling very strong that although they were willing to be open and affirming and welcoming was the language that we use at that particular point in time um, and felt that the church should make changes, um, they were not comfortable doing that. They were concerned about what would this mean in terms of how we would be approached in terms of receiving uh, able appointments of pastors and, and what would this do to our 
apportionments. And all kinds of institutional questions were a part of that that were significant to be dealt with. The end result of that tension was is that we formed a group for lack of a creative title, uh, the conversation continues. And um, this was not to be just about uh, the Reconciling Ministries Caucus, but it was to be about what does it mean for us to continue to grow and, and to expand who we are as a congregation that is seeking to be uh, more welcoming. When the time came to actually make the decision uh, to vote as to whether or not we were going to become a Reconciling Ministries Network Church officially, um, it, the vote was unanimous that we would become uh, a church at that point. So, I think it was me, but it, in our staff meetings, it was everybody at the same time. We, I said, well, we have to do it in a worship service. So, uh, because who can vote no in a worship service? Uh, right there in front of God who made us all and loves us all. Well, certainly the vote empowered me. I felt that I had the wind in my sails and I had, I don't think of uh, water images, but I had our solid raft underneath me to, 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 to go move through the waters. It was part of the church in a different way than being kind of clandestine. Um, uh, this time it was just part of who we are. And we ended up then using a lot of their resources, uh, claiming the promise. Um, we taught not only in the life of the congregation, uh, but we also opened it up and did it um, other places. Uh, we had a uh, circle of faith um, came to life and our participation in um, the pride uh, moved from being simply a parade to having some, some uh, varying kinds of booths. And we were in this church, well schooled by Rini Wan and all the pastors before to be inclusive and be ready to be welcoming. But how did anybody on the street know that if they came into this big foreboding building, which it could be, particularly if you have wounds, from church, early church. So how difficult to climb those stairs, especially the stairs from Center Avenue, enormous stairs up to the church. Good morning, kids. Welcome to family time. I'm so glad that you're here today. Let's start with our prayer of gratitude. Lord, thank you for all that we are given. Especially the love in the hearts of many. The sun, moon, stars, and sky. Family, friends, and fun. And most of all, for the opportunity to help others. Amen. So this month, June, in church, we have been talking about and celebrating the great diversity in God's creation, all the different ways that God has made us and that God has made love. And so we've talked about uh, the diversity in the created world, all the different species there are, and we've talked about, among us, the diversity of body shapes and sizes. And today I want to talk to you about racial and ethnic diversity. God has made us with all different colors of skin and textures of hair and face shapes, God has made us to live in a beautiful array of diverse cultures, and it makes the world cool. It makes the world exciting. But there is a problem. You know, throughout our world's history, some people have thought because the color of their skin is one color and not another, or some other feature about their body that they are better, uh, more valuable than someone else. So in the history of our country, the United States of America, for instance, um, people of African descent were for hundreds of years stolen from their homelands, ripped away from their families, packed into ships, and brought over to this country to be sold as slaves, property of other people, of white people, forced to do really demeaning and difficult labor for no money uh, just because they were owned by someone else. It's a terrible blight on the history 
of our country. And this weekend, we're celebrating a day called Juneteenth. Have you heard of this? Kind of a funny word, right? Juneteenth. It's a combination word for June 19th. June 19th, Juneteenth. June 19th, 1865, that's before I was even born, before your parents or your grandparents were even born, uh, was the day when federal troops made it to Galveston, Texas, to emancipate, to free the last slaves in America. It was almost three years after the president at that time, Abraham Lincoln, had declared slaves to be free in something called the Emancipation Proclamation. But it took that long before there was Twitter and Instagram to get the word across the country. And so on this day, we celebrate that great movement forward in our country's consciousness where we realized that no one uh, is someone else's property. But we also, on this day of celebration, remember that we have a long way to go before everyone in all of our great and beautiful diversity that God has created us in, before everyone is treated with equality and justice and dignity. So we celebrate, yay, Juneteenth, slaves were freed and we remember that we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do to ensure that all people created in God's image, in God's beautiful and diverse and vastly different and, and, and varied image, are to be treated with justice and with dignity. And that it's our job as we bring about the kingdom of God to ensure that that happens in every corner of the world that we're a part of. So I hope that you celebrate this weekend. I hope that you celebrate this beautiful work of justice in the world. And I hope that you take some time with your parents or with some friends to think about what you can do to help bring about the equality and the justice in your little corner of the world. And as you do that, I hope that you know that God is with you right where you are. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Behind me, you will see a beautiful expression of diversity, beauty, richness, and texture. All of the marvelous, amazing things that our God has put into each of us with love, with care, and with promise. This is an expression of who we are at this church, and it is an expression of who we are as members of the Reconciling Ministries Network. Good morning, First Church. It is such a pleasure and such an honor for me to be here with you, my family, you all have been the world to me, and whatever and whoever I am, you all have had a big part in it, and I dearly thank you for it. Today, I'm going to talk, to some, talk about something that's very, very important, I know, for all of you and for anyone 
who cares deeply about diversity. You see, the body of Christ is one of the rock-solid pillars in the foundation of the Christmas of the Christian church and it's embraced by the apostle Paul in his writings as an expression of unity purpose and diversity among God's people and God's children yet so many believers down through the ages has seemingly brushed aside or beloved doctrine when it comes to how they want to express their faith and treat other people who may not agree with them, who may not look like them, or think like them, and just simply dismiss them as unimportant to our faith. For them, it is a doctrine not of unity and diversity, it is a doctrine of discomfort for them. They seem to want to ignore the basic premises upon which we have embraced the body of Christ as soon as they walk out the church door on Sunday mornings. The body of Christ contains no exceptions, no asterisks, no small print, and no footnote that would allow for the kind of treatments that people who are different often get in the church. If you really want to understand what the body of Christ is all about as a theory, as a foundation for us. It's simply this. God is for all of us. God loves all of us. God is with all of us. And God manifests love for all of creation as blessed and sacred. And that includes the LGBTQ plus community. Fortunately, we are graced with the Reconciling Ministries Network, which courageously has upheld and embraced the body of Christ despite attacks, innuendos, threats, and other unpleasantries from people who really would rather not want to look at the body of Christ as a foundation for their own actions as Christians. And First United Methodist Church has done the very same. It has upheld the idea of unity and inclusion for longer than I can remember. This church, or a church, along with the Reconciling Ministries Network, is working tirelessly, forthrightly, and diligently in its efforts to uphold diversity at all times. That diversity, that richness and texture and expression that comprises the body of Christ is all part of God's stupendous, unimaginably wonderful plan for all of us, regardless of who we are. If you examine the content of Paul's scripture, on the body of Christ, you will note that it relies very heavily on interdependency. Interdependency is not something you can have if you only have a group of people as opposed to a body of people comprised of all parts. In Paul's con concept of the body of Christ, all of us help each other. All of us need each other in order to be the best that we can be as God's creations. And all of us have responsibilities for caring and upholding others. Each part of Christ's body has a role, a purpose, a call, if you will. 
And for most of us humans, it is something we must work on all of our lives. Understanding ourselves, understanding our relationship to others within the body of Christ, and making every effort to understand our unique, particular call in this life. Listen to the words of Paul. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as God wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. We who bear the challenge of being created in diversity have suffered many fights, many arguments, many feelings and events of rejection, and just downright hate, simply because others cannot get their hearts around the fact that we all have value, and all of us are part of the world and part of the body of Christ in particular. And we are all familiar with the results of diminishing the power and worth of the body of Christ. It's happened for centuries. Dating back to the times when missionaries were going to other countries and in going to other countries, used a relationship which deprived those who were native to that country of their values, their culture, and their human worth. And it's continued to this very day with all of the issues and problems and difficulties we're having around systemic racism. We have to think about what would the body of Christ be like if it were not a complete body of various parts? It would be a body, an incomplete body, without legs to move forward or follow a path that leads to confronting and ending injustice, poverty, and oppression. It would be an incomplete body which can go nowhere and accomplish nothing. The body, bereft of its parts, is locked into a stationary, unmovable position. Without each of its parts doing its task and its calling and working with others at the same time, that body, that incomplete body, could accomplish very little. What a blessing that our God embraces a complete body, a complete body of beauty, diversity, texture, and promise. So the question that we all have to deal with at some point is how do we once more encourage others to embrace the whole body of Christ, the complete body of Christ? What must we do to make the body of Christ, that complete body, a living, breathing, complete entity, not a body that some seem to prefer that would be deaf to us or to be deaf to the cries of the oppressed, and those who have suffered discrimination and hatred. The best way to get at this task of making the body of Christ complete is to vanquish fear. Because you see, the truth is that fear is what disables the body of Christ as it is presented by Christians these days. It is fear of the other that renders the body of Christ speechless, renders the ears deaf to the cries of others, and without a heart to feel the desperate needs of others, 
the body of Christ becomes inhumane and, and, and just very, very unaware of what others are going through in their suffering. We want the complete body of Christ. And that may well be why in, the, in Scripture you'll often see the words, be not afraid or fear not. Did you know it was used over 300 times in the Scripture? It is time for Christians everywhere to confront any fear and apprehension that they have at the mention of the word diversity. It's time for us, all of us, to embrace the Holy Spirit by listening to the still small voice within us that says, I value and love all of you. It is time to truly be the body of Christ. It is time to put our full support behind the work of the Reconciling Ministries Network and throw open the door of welcome to all and toss away the shackles of fear and division. It is time for us as Christians to work tireless, tirelessly to make all the body of Christ a whole, a diverse body of interactive, interdependent parts who have regard for others and who care for others. It is time to release the fear and embrace courage once and for all. Be blessed until we meet again. Amen. Beloved one, we offer our thanks for the holy witness in the lives of LGBTQ2SIA plus people. In queer love and in trans and intersex bodies, we have experienced Christ enfleshed. In the faith of those who have been persecuted by the church, Christ is revealed. In the queer practices of community, of love that takes risks, and of telling the truth, even when it's costly, Christ lives on. In gratitude for these and all the sacred gifts of the LGBTQ2SIA plus community, we give our thanks and we offer these gifts. Amen. Let us receive our blessing. Let us go from here to proclaim the good news. God takes on flesh in the strange and surprising. Love liberates from the margins. Together, we have what we need to resist evil and oppression. With a renewed commitment to solidarity with God and all LGBTQ2SIA plus people, May the Spirit lead us from this place with peace. Amen and amen.
fully witness in the lives of LGBTQ. 